that we shall neither commit nor provoke aggression, that we shall neither flee nor invoke the threat of force. Terror is not a new weapon. Throughout history, it has been used by those who could not prevail, either by persuasion or example. But inevitably, they fail, either because men are not afraid to die for a white life worth living, or because the terrorists themselves came to realize that free men cannot be frightened by threats and that aggression would meet its own response. And it is in the light of that history that every nation today should know, be he friend or foe, that the United States has both the will and the weapons to join free men in standing up to their responsibilities. I have a dream. I have been accused by a number of people, some of them journalists, of a distortion of history. And if there is any common thread of attack uh, running through claims of those critics of JFK, it is a notion that somehow there is an accepted, settled, respected, carefully thought out and researched body of history about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. By the time the House Select Committee on Assassinations disbanded in 1979, it had uncovered serious discrepancies in the official record in areas such as the medical evidence and the role of intelligence agencies. But this information was classified, hidden from the public, and not mentioned in the final report. Instead, acoustic evidence discovered at the last minute revealed that at least four shots had been fired in Dealey Plaza. Meaning, according to the committee, a second shooter joined Oswald at firing at the president. The case was handed off to the Justice Department of the incoming Reagan administration, which arranged two panels to discredit the acoustic evidence. And that was the end of the official investigations of the 1970s. The verdict remained a lone gunman. Although books were published and researchers continued to utilize the Freedom of Information Act through the 1980s, the Kennedy case largely dropped from the public radar. So when Oliver Stone's film JFK was released in 1991, it was certainly the highest profile effort in years and served to bring the case fully back into the public eye. And this prompted immediate outrage from the American establishment. While the movie was expressing information and ideas that had been developed by the research community for almost three decades, the criticisms of the film were framed as personal attacks on the director, Oliver Stone, and he was forced to pay a personal cost in the culture at large, just as Jim Garrison did 25 years before. To this day, in the mainstream media, the name Oliver Stone is sort of a shorthand for unhinged conspiracy theorist. This was a package of unfathomable lies packaged together though uh, with a, a cinema artist's great skill that was a blend of real photographs and fictional scenes that merged together with such skill that you were unable to tell the difference. Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, is one continuous lie. Not one piece of evidence pointing towards Oswald's guilt in three hours and eight minutes. So, Stone got by with cinematic murder. This credibility has been completely destroyed, at least as far as this, as this case is concerned. You can't distort history, and he's done that. JFK misrepresents the truth the same way that Joseph Goebbels misrepresented the truth as he cranked up the propaganda machine for Nazi Germany. Misrepresentations, omissions, lies that have been perpetrated by Warner Brothers Costner and Stone. What they have done is just plain evil. Let's face it, no one likes to be called a liar, let alone an evil Nazi. But one might ask, didn't Oliver Stone invite these charges by filling his movie with distortion or disinformation? Well, for one thing, Oliver Stone never claimed that his film was the absolute truth, and he was always upfront about where and when he used dramatic license. But consider this, looking back at the film from the vantage point of today and in the context of all the accusations against it, Stone's JFK matches up against the historic record a lot better, certainly, than the Warren Report. 
On the 40th anniversary of the assassination, ABC News broadcast a program titled Beyond Conspiracy, which suggested that the consistent poll numbers showing distrust in the official story of a lone gunman was largely the result of a gullible public swayed by the cinematic lies of con artist Oliver Stone. The program offered examples of what it called fundamental facts beyond dispute, which were allegedly distorted in the film. It's worthwhile taking a closer look at these facts. Fact. The distance from the sniper's nest in the window to the president in the car at the time of the fatal shot was 88 yards. For a former Marine sharpshooter, which Oswald was, the shot was well within his capability. Well, I have here uh, Oswald's uh, scorebook from the Marine Corps, uh, where he, when he did his practicing, he demonstrated that he was highly competent as a, as a marksman. Uh, for example, here is a type of target which is shaped very much like the head and shoulders of President Kennedy sticking up above the rear seat of the car. And this is at 200 yards, which is more than twice the distance of Dallas. And this rapid fire, which uh, certainly was true of Dallas, and he scores 48 out of a possible 50, which I can tell you is, is excellent. Well, you say that's this one day. Well, here's another one. Same thing, 200 yards, twice the distance, and rapid fire, and he scores 49 out of a possible 50. So he was not only a very good shot, but he was consistent. What John Latimer and ABC News do not tell their viewers is that Oswald's shooting skills were tested twice while he was in the Marines. The first test in 1956, which Latimer refers to, occurred after an intensive three-week training period solely concerned with rifles. Oswald scored 212, two marks above the minimum for sharpshooter. In May 1959, Oswald was tested again without the benefit of intensive training beforehand and he scored 191, one mark above the minimum for the low ranking of marksman. Colonel Allison Folsom testified to the Warren Commission that such a result indicated Oswald was a poor shooter as most of his Marine buddies said he was. They're telling us that Oswald got off three shots with world-class precision from a manual bolt action and rifle in less than six seconds. The Stone film is wrong. The first shot was fired around frame 160 of the Zapruder film the second at frame 223, and the last shot at frame 312. Three shots in 8.3 seconds. For Oswald, that was plenty of time. Dr. Latimer has simulated the Kennedy shooting dozens of times. He's 89 years old. This is uh, exactly like the gun that Oswald used. Since he got his shots off in eight and a half seconds, I'll show you that it's possible to come close to that. And here we go. So we'll slide in our telescope and get off one shot. And then a second. And then a third. Taking a little more time for the last one as he did. I don't know what rifle John Latimer is posing with, but for ABC News to insinuate that it is in any way comparable to the rifle found in the school book depository is an insult to the intelligence of its viewers. Ronald Simmons of the U.S. Army testified to the Warren Commission that examination of the actual rifle revealed serious problems with the bolt and trigger mechanisms, requiring great effort to open the bolt great effort to actually fire the weapon and resulting in the weapon firing off target. Robert Fraser, the FBI's firearm specialist, also testified to the Warren Commission that the rifle was inherently inaccurate. The program's assertion that the first shot occurred at frame 160 of the Zapruder film simply has no corroboration. The only official finding as to the shot sequence produced by the House Select Committee and Assassinations photographic panel placed the first shot at frame 190. While frame 160 may fit better a predetermined conclusion that the single bullet theory is possible, what ABC News does not share is that at frame 160, the view of the limousine from the alleged sniper's nest was obscured by branches of an oak tree. 
as seen in the Secret Service recreation from 1964, we are asked to believe that a would-be assassin passed up a perfect opportunity so that he could fire his first shot through a tree. The single bullet that struck President Kennedy and Governor Connolly did not hang in midair. It did not zigzag right and then left. It went straight through the president and into the governor. This is Warren Commission Exhibit 399, the bullet that passed through the president's neck and the governor's chest that broke the governor's wrist and lodged in his left thigh. In Stone's film, it is referred to as the pristine bullet. There is no way, the Stone film says, that the bullet could have caused so many wounds and come out at the end virtually unmarked. The problem was that people were denying that there was any damage. They were calling it pristine. And it's absolutely, positively not pristine. It's flat. I urge the viewer to use common sense. Let's refer to the U.S. Army's number one ballistic expert at Edgewood Arsenal. Dr. Joseph Dulcey told the Warren Commission in the spring of 1964 that it was not possible for any bullet to strike and break bone and end up looking like Commission Exhibit 399. Another fact the Warren Commission decided to omit from the report. As for the animation used by this program, which claims to prove the single bullet theory possible, researchers such as Pass Beer, over several chapters on his website, and Robert Harris, with his online video critiques, have convincingly demonstrated the obvious problems and distortions, not least of which are the bizarre hunchback figure of JFK and the skewed perspective between JFK six foot in real life, and John Conley, who was six foot four inches. Back and to the left. For some conspiracy theorists, this is proof that the president was shot in the head by a second gunman who was ahead of the president's car on the grassy knoll. But back and to the left in no way indicates where a bullet came from. Bodies struck by bullets sometimes go forward and sometimes backward. The evidence that's definitive in determining whether it was a shot from the front or a shot from the back, is the entry wound, the cratered entry wound on the back of Kennedy's skull, which proves that that shot was from the back, not from the front. The president's autopsy x-rays and photographs show the precise location where the fatal bullet entered the back of his head. Once again, use your common sense. An honest program would have acknowledged that there are serious discrepancies in the medical record. There is no excuse that in 2003 they ignore the fact that a central focus of the 1990s Assassination and Records Review Board was an attempt to reconcile conflicting evidence between x-rays, witness testimony, missing photographs, wound placement, and the serious flaws of the autopsy to begin with. The creation of the Assassination Records and Review Board in 1992 was one victory resulting from Oliver Stone's film JFK. I am very proud that JFK has been a part of the momentum to open previously closed files in the matter of the assassination. Congressman Lewis Stokes of Ohio, who chaired the uh, House Select Committee on Assassinations, has announced his willingness to consider the opening of the files, closed until, as you know, the year 2029. In addition, Judge William Webster, formerly the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and of the CIA, has indicated his strong opinion that all of the files, all of the files, House, Committee, CIA, and FBI among them, be made public. A proposal I was extremely pleased uh, last weekend to see endorsed by Senator Edward Kennedy. Now, if the Army and Navy intelligence services will join suit, it is my hope the American people will have the full truth of this assassination. This is a really important episode, Gary, and uh, I have a great deal to say about it. I'll begin with a critique of the attacks on Oliver Stone and then explain what Oliver Stone didn't have right, even though it's a masterpiece, a brilliant piece of work. The beginning with the attacks by Jack Valenti, uh, Vince uh, Bugliosi, and David Bellin, of course, are vicious and ill-founded. A lot of public knows today that Jack Valenti actually married a secretary of Lyndon Johnson, whom he had impregnated 
and has raised Lyndon's daughter, which makes him incredibly biased in wanting to maintain the reputation of Lyndon Johnson, who played the pivotal role in the assassination of his predecessor. As the head of uh, Hollywood, he undermined the nomination of Oliver Stone's film for Best Picture nomination, which instead, because of Jack Valenti's efforts, I have no doubt, went to a film about a sadistic cannibal of no particular significance. Vince Bugliosi, of course, has done a huge, voluminous work that is really for naught because he ignores uh, the principle of accounting for all of the available evidence. There are nice reviews of Bugliosi's book on assassinationscience.com, authored by David W. Mantic, MD, PhD, who is the leading expert on the medical evidence in the world today, and, and me. Owen is well known as the most vicious defender of the Warren Commission, and, and no one who is looking for truth can expect anything remotely approximating that from David Bellin. Now, they mentioned the ABC program Beyond Conspiracy and break it up into four parts, which are important. Uh, the first claim being made that Oswald was a good shot. So here we get John Latimer, who happens to be a urologist who's become deeply involved in the case, showing Oswald's scorecard from his qualification, which I believe was 1957 instead of 56 rifle range. He, he was under completely different conditions. Uh, he was uh, not trained to use a bolt-action rifle. He was not trained to use a telescopic sight. He was not firing at a moving target or down from a high building. So the comparison is quite ridiculous. In 1958, of course, he didn't fire at all because he, he didn't make it to the rifle range, having been at the Monterey Language School. Then in 1959, he dropped already 21 points, barely qualified at 191. There's no serious doubt that uh, this man was a mediocre shot. And I say that as a former Marine Corps officer who used to supervise recruit training on the same rifle range, Jetson Range Camp Pendleton, and the same recruit depot in San Diego where Lee Oswald took his training. The second claim that the film makes is that the rifle was capable of the deed, but in fact the rifle was a piece of junk. It was a 6.5 millimeter mass-produced weapon that has been well dispatched in previous segments of this show. It was known as the humanitarian rifle for never actually harming anyone on purpose. And when Peter Jennings talks about, of course, the 8.3 seconds now, he's actually extended what has previously been presumed to have been six seconds. But the fact is the best possible shot had Lee Oswald been in the building at the sixth floor, which he was not, would have been as the vehicle was coming up Houston Street when he could have, even as mediocre a marksman as he was, might very well have hit the president. And, of course, the, the third claim that the uh, single bullet theory is true is completely indefensible. There was no damage to the bullet itself, as we well know. And in, uh, I've already explained how the bullet appears to have been uh, discovered by the driver of the Secret Service, the limousine, who got the bucket and sponge and began washing the blood and brains out of the limousine at Parkland and then discovered the bullet, which appears to have come out of the shot that hit JFK in the back about five and a half inches below the, the back, which by itself refutes the magic bullet theory. So the disregard of evidence here, we're talking about the shirt, the jacket, the FBI sketch, the president's personal physician's autopsy report and so forth is quite revealing of the extent to which they're willing to ignore the relevant evidence. Remember, I presented all of this at Cambridge and published it in an international peer-reviewed journal, which everyone can find online under the heading reasoning about assassinations. Using Pat Spear and Robert Harris to talk about the single bullet theory is a poor choice when they could have had someone truly expert in the medical evidence like David Manning, who, of course, took a patient with similar chest and neck dimensions, created a CAT scan where he introduced the magic bullet trajectory and found it's not even anatomically possible. So you have Peter Jennings and ABC promoting a theory not even anatomically possible. They talk about, number four, the medical record being definitive. But this is very, very interesting indeed because the medical evidence they're talking about is the HSCA's reconstruction of the location of the wound. There's mention here of a blowout to the back of the head being indicative of a shot from behind, but that's simply absurd. We know from the Parkland physicians and from Clint Hill's own vivid description that it was a fist-sized blowout at the back of his head. Physician after physician at Parkland
Kirkland reports it, including the extruding cerebellar as well as cerebral tissue, where the cerebellum is a compact part at the base of the brain. There's no possible way that would have happened under the fantastic scenario given by the HSCA, which doesn't even accommodate the fact that Commander Humes had taken a cranial saw to the skull of JFK and enormously enlarged the wound so now that it represented virtually the whole back and top of his head having missing, which is uh, defined mathematically in the official autopsy report from Bethesda, uh, which I published in Assassination Science 1998 as an appendix, along with diagrams by Charles Crenshaw, M.D., uh, who was there, of the wound to the throat, a small clean puncture wound, and the wound to the back of the head, where it's embarrassing that ABC News, which once used to be a, an admirable news organization, is promoting such gr gross forms of disinformation, but where it's even more revealing that the HSCA was complicit in covering up the medical evidence, and where I am increasingly alarmed that the medical panel there was uh, complicit in the cover-up. Uh, remember, Michael Bad an MD, who was the head of the medical panel, observed that if the magic bullet theory were false, then there had to have been at least six shots from three different directions. Well, we have proven that the magic bullet theory was false. We also know that uh, JFK was hit at least uh, four times himself, so there were at least three misses. So this whole thing is complete malarkey. It is not based in evidence. It's a fabrication. ABC News ought to be ashamed. And I think there's every reason in the world to, to hold in contempt individuals uh, such as uh, Vincent Bugliosi, uh, uh, Jack Valenti, and David Ballin, who had an agenda to promote. Now, I've implied already that Oliver Stone, had, there were three faults in the film, which I think is a magnificent piece of work, fully deserving of the best picture. In fact, it's a, one of the most important films ever produced in the history of Hollywood. Uh, which are these? And number one, that Oliver thought there were only three hit teams, but when there actually appear to have been at least six. So while he shows three hit teams, there not only was a shooter then at the top of the county records building at the left side of the triple underpass in the in the book depository uh, on the grassy knoll in on the, the north side of the triple underpass, but also a shooter in the book depository itself who appears to have been firing at John Connolly who I believe to have been Malcolm Mack Wallace, Lyndon Johnson's personal hitman, who murdered at least a dozen persons for Lyndon, including one of his own sisters, and whose fingerprint was found on a box that was used to arrange the alleged uh, assassin's lair, number one. Number two, uh, Oliver did not understand, and I think this was largely under the influence of Robert Grodin, who was serving as an advisor in making the film, that the Zapruder film had been massively re-edited. In fact, we even get a discussion here of the back and to the left motion, which appears to have been a result of uh, the way in which the film was edited, where those who have actually seen in the, what appears to be the unedited version of the film, and there are at least a half a dozen, uh, but the fact is that JFK, was hit in the, when he was hit in the back of the head, he slumped forward. Remember, he was wearing a back race. Jackie Easton back up was looking him right in the face when he was hit in the right temple, and he slumped to the left. No witness of Dealey Plaza. None of them reported the violent back and to the left, which appears to have resulted from merging the two shots, so that when they tried to put them together, they left one frame where his head is moving forward, and then the slumping to the left resulted, was turned into a violent to the left by removing too many frames. So he made it very violent and to the left, but that did not happen in Dealey Plaza. Josiah Thompson had a wonderful analysis of the double hit theory to wit that he was hit in the back of the head and then left into the rear, based on the extant version of the Zapruder film, where it's already provable that there are two different hits to JFK in the extant film itself because of the way in which it was edited. In his book, Six Seconds in Dallas, which he has, of course, subsequently disavowed in his ongoing efforts to try to shed any any evidence of conspiracy, I'm convinced, as I explained in the JFK, the CIA, and the New York Times, he was setting himself up to disavow the existence of conspiracy on the 50th observance of the assassination, which is despicable by itself. But the original study in his book is quite brilliant, based on the excellent film. Then, in addition, David Lifton had taken frames from the Zapruder film to Caltech, where he visited with Richard Feynman, one of the world's great physicists, who observed that there was forward motion. He made measurements internal to the photographs. 
uh, that there had been, uh, you know, a double hit already, which you can find in a very important footnote in his book, Best Evidence, originally published in 1980. So we already had, ex you know, evidence of the two hits that had been merged together here. But in addition, uh, when we have the witnesses who have seen the unedited film, we know what happened and that he slumped forward which is what Dan Rather reported, by the way, when he rushed from seeing the film on Saturday, the day after the assassination on television, and said that JFK had fallen forward. He was widely condemned for that after the film was eventually released by Robert Grodin and put on Geraldo Rivera's America show, where, he, uh, where Grodin appeared with Dick Gregory, because you got the back into the left violent motion. But Grodin, even to this day, doesn't understand that the film was massively edited to conceal the limousine stop, which was such a glaring indication of Secret Service complicity, and uh, as well as the, uh, the way in which the shots were administered to JFK, where they have painted over the blowout at the back of the head, they painted in the bulge of brains to the right front, uh, which even Roderick Ryan, who was a Hollywood special effects expert, explained to Noel Twyman when he was uh, preparing his book, uh, Best Evidence and uh, where the film itself internally isn't even consistent because I discovered you can see in frame 374 where the blowout is actually evident, you can see it, and inconsistent with those earlier frames, 3, 14, 15, 16, 17, for example, as special cases. So Oliver, number one, had too few hit teams. Number two, didn't realize the film had been altered. And number three, didn't realize that uh, Lee Oswald was actually captured in the famous photograph by James I. Colchin standing in the doorway, where it was Ralph C.K. who, as a chiropractor, used to dealing with individuals' bodies and the way their clothing fits, that had the genius to realize that it wasn't the face, which was ambiguous because they'd introduced features of Billy Lovelady and imposed them over the features of Doorman, but it was the shirt and the jacket he was wearing, the height and the build, where we have confirmed that the height, the build, the shirt, the t-shirt, and so forth were uh, the same as those that Lee Oswald was wearing when he was arrested. They made him take off the shirt for the, for the booking photograph so it wouldn't be conspicuous because they already apparently knew they had a problem here with this photograph. But where Billy Lovelady said he thought it was very odd that he would be confused with Oswald because he was two to three inches shorter and 15 to 20 pounds heavier, where Billy actually appears to have been captured in that photograph too, to the left of a doorman, to the right as you face the photograph with his hands up raised, protecting his eyes from the sun, wearing a short sleeve, red and white, vertically striped shirt, which when the FBI called him in to show them the shirt he'd been wearing that day on 29 February 1964, they duly photographed, in which we published many places in a whole series of uh, studies. Uh, but where on all of this you can find a nice summary in my article entitled uh, The JFK War, the Challenging Case of Robert Grodin. And where the only other figure who's been offered as a candidate was someone further down in the crowd, a big hefty guy who must have outweighed doorman by 30 or pounds or more, wearing a red and black uh, checkered shirt which is buttoned up to the neck. Doorman shirt, of course, is splayed open. It isn't a red and black checkered shirt. So that we have the preposterous situation that many alleged experts on the assassination of JFK can't claim. They can't distinguish between whether Doorman was uh, Lee Oswald and where Richard Hook has found, you know, a minimum of like uh, 27 points of uh, similarity between the shirt Doorman is wearing, the shirt Oswald was wearing when he was arrested, and he's a similar height and build to Lee Oswald, but not to either Billy Lovelady or the man in the checkered shirt. It's a simple argument by elimination, A or B or C, but not B and not C, therefore A. It had to have been Oswald. There's no other, you know, explanation that makes any sense. In fact, the CIA went so far to cover this up as to fabricate newspapers to support the contention that the options had been published too quickly to be altered, but where Ralph C.K. again displaying his genius discovered that to be the case, and where I present both of the issues for the Beacon Hill newspaper, the original, a little 10,000 uh, population community in Michigan, in places such as JFK at 50, the who, the how, and the why. 
so Oliver Stone did a magnificent job. He was wrong on a couple of points, but I think that Robert Groden played a key role in misleading him, and I find it despicable that individuals such as Josiah Thompson, Robert Groden, and others continue to persist to this day in the face of overwhelming evidence to maintain that the Zapruder film is authentic, which is provably false, not to mention their unwillingness to consider that Lee Oswald was actually in the doorway by again ignoring the evidence as we found in the recent case of Robert Groden's appearance on Leno Sank's Black Op Radio, where he issues these denials that I am correct, but he offers no evidence whatsoever, and where I reiterate my desire to debate the man and demonstrate that he is a phony and a fraud who has betrayed his legacy of good work in the past in relation to uh, carrying the case forward and exposing the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about the assassination of JFK. I mean, for God's sake, Gary, I've even explained in my latest article on JFK that JFK escort officers speak the Fred Newcomb interviews with Larry Rivera, that one of the officers, uh, Bobby Hargis, even walked between the two limousines in order to get to the other side of Elm Street, which is preposterous if the vehicles had not been stopped. So I think that this case is completely resolved for those who are rational and looking at the evidence and not seeking to participate in the cover-up who are in fact turning themselves into accessories after the fact.